installed and open those and uh, pass them around. Yeah. I also got I also got pins which are fantastic for stabbing your pants. everyone's teardown going? Yeah? yeah? All right, cool, cool. I, just, I saw a couple, I saw um, Bunny's talk today, and I thought that was really good. Um, I've always been really interested in the sort of uh, political legal spectrum of hacking things. Um, because, partly because we've made it so hard, you know, in, in the United States with the, D, uh, with the DMCA. It's really interesting because it's like, Old guys regulating and legislating things that they know they know nothing about. You know, it's like that uh, the Facebook hearing the other day that happened was sort of bizarre. You know, questions that were asked and these people had absolutely no no clue like like what was happening there and, and how Facebook actually worked. Um, and I think that the DMCA was is uh, a, a prime example of that. A prime example of of people legislating things that they just you know fully fully don't understand. Um, to get kind of an idea here, uh, how many people would consider themselves in this room like a low-level hacker? Let's, uh, I have to go over here. Yeah. What's happening? If you want to be recorded. Oh, this is, this is this frames like right here? Yeah. Okay, what, oh, oh, that's, that's right there. Um, okay, so how many people here would consider themselves like a low-level hacker or hardware hacker? Um, one person, two people, all right. And how many people would like uh, consider themselves uh, uh, like kind of a higher level hacker um, building things, um, not super low level? So kind of the rest of you, cool, all right. Fantastic, um, so this talk is, uh, is a, little, a little higher level in the sense that um, this is about um, uh, how to enable folks to kind of do uh, more practical hacking, more uh, you know, future technology stuff. Uh, my name is Brian Kosnich, and I am the uh, I'm a co-founder, CEO of Wilderness Labs. Um, previous company was Xamarin. We um, we brought Xamarin was was really fun and interesting. We brought uh, Mono to the mobile space, and then a couple of years ago, we sold that to Microsoft for uh, you know nice amounts of money, and then. Uh, I, you know, was in a big company. I, I, I saw my team get transitioned over, and then I had to get out because big companies aren't really my thing. I really like the startup thing. So I started a new company, and um, we're around trying to make hardware development uh, fast, as fast and as easy as software development. So what we're trying to do is trying to bring the app developers, web developers, um, you know, of of the day, and and bring them into the hardware space because I think that hardware is like the most important thing that's happening. Right like bar none in technology, hardware is the most important thing. Um, these slides, by the way, have a lot of links in them, so you can find them at slideshare.net slash Brian Kostinich. Um, hopefully you can see that. Um, maybe the internet the dehydrator is in the way. Uh, so yeah, definitely check out the slides um, for links uh, to code and 3D uh, printing designs and, and whatnot. Um, so today I'm going to talk about, we're going to talk about uh, uh, hacking appliances and uh, don't be shy, come on in. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, sort of hacking practical things. And um, it's really funny, when we started Xamarin, uh, I used to go around and uh, I was a developer evangelist before we had developer evangelism. I, I, that wasn't my title, but I would go out and, you know, we were a very small company. I think when I came on board, there were six of us. And so I would go out and I would, I would talk to people about how important mobile was and the mobile revolution and stuff. And um, it, was really, it was really fun because I would go out and inspire people to build cool mobile things on Xamarin. And I would tell people, look, this mobile thing is like going to be huge. You've got to be, if you're, not, if you're not paying attention now, then you know, it's sort of going to pass you by. And it was really fun because I'd go out and I'd talk to people like you guys. And uh, a year later, six months later, a year and a half later, I would get emails and say, hey, look what I launched. And, and a number of the top apps in the App Store were actually built on Xamarin. It was, it was a lot of fun. Um, 
and to like be part of that and, and, and build a platform that really enabled people. And so here I am again, it's six years later and I'm doing the same thing with hardware. And, and hardware to me uh, is, is really incredibly, like I said, it's really incredibly important. And, and I've been sort of hacking and building my entire life. I've always really liked um, uh, breaking things and putting them, or taking things apart and putting them back together. And um, you know, I think that the, that age that is, is upon us. Uh, some interesting things uh, about hardware. Uh, I think it's the most important part of the computing revolution right now. The experiences that will happen 10 years from now are all gonna be powered by uh, hardware, by commodity, um, commodity microcontrollers, and we're gonna have really sophisticated experiences around that. Um, it's, it's hard to believe, but 10 years ago, the iPhone was launched. So fast forward 10 years from now, and everything's gonna be connected. It's gonna be hard to buy a product that isn't connected. You know, your toothbrush, the electric toothbrush will be connected. It'll have an ESP32 chip in there, and it'll be, you know, it'll talk to your, you'll, it'll, it'll track your kids, your kids' uh, teeth brushing habits and whatnot. Um, and there's a mass amount of money being spent in this space. So GE says in industrial IoT alone over the next um, uh, 15 years, $60 trillion will be spent. That's a phenomenally large amount of money. That's, I mean, that's massive. That's just like, that's mind blowing. And, and hopefully um, everyone in this room will get a piece of that, you know, because you're here early and you're, and you're sort of like on the rewriting of the forefront, the wave of, of the revolution. Um, so I like to, I like to, I think it helps to imagine a specific piece of technology um, to sort of like make this real. And so I like to give the example of um, a connected fridge, or the smart fridge of the future. And you can imagine the smart fridge of the future has cameras in the threshold. You load your groceries in and it recognizes what's going in. It keeps an inventory, uh, can give you dietary uh, recommendations, can give you recipes based on what's your, in your fridge. Of course, it will automatically order when you're low on on milk, and then there will be personalized experience. If you're if you're uh, gluten free, you know, and you reach for the bread, it'd probably say, hey, "Hey, Daniel, not the thing you want to do today." Um, and of course, it will be integrated with everything else in your house. So when you pull a frozen uh, pizza out of the freezer, Google Home or Alexa is going to say, "Hey, do you want me to do you want me to warm up the the oven or the toaster oven?" Right? And so all this this like connected. Um, experience, uh, this integrated experience will be sort of uh, table stakes for products of the future. Uh, and I think that, that the, <clears throat> there's three parts, of three, three parts of the IoT market, IoT is a stupid word, but there's um, sort of three segments, there's consumer like this, there's uh, commercial, you know, smart buildings and things like that, and industrial, which is industrial control, factories, water treatment, etc. Um, and I think that the winning experiences in commercial and industrial IoT will be just as sophisticated as the consumer experiences. Now they'll leg because the consumer experiences uh, that are launched on crowd, fund, crowd supply and, and Kickstarter and stuff will sort of disrupt and that will lead the market. Um, and the thing that's making all this possible are microcontrollers. Uh, bar none, like there's a lot of really interesting hardware out there, but commodity devices, commodity chips that are $1.20 to, you know, to six or seven dollars, are the devices, are the, are the heart, the brain of what's gonna, what's gonna power this um, revolution. And um, who here uh, kind of understands what a microcontroller is? All right, it's so no one, I don't have to explain, I think, what a microcontroller is, you guys get it. Um, that's fantastic. This chip right here, this ESP32 chip, by the way, is the chip of the future. And we'll, we'll see this and its brethren, um, the clones of this chip, will power the devices that we use in the next five, 10 years. This chip is phenomenally powerful and it's gonna change the world. I swear to God, uh, made in Shenzhen, yeah, it's incredible. Um, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, built in, it's $1.20. At the base, it's $1.20 for like a microcontroller. This is the chip that you're going to put in your smart, uh, your smart toothbrush that one of you guys is going to make. How does like certification work for that stuff? Like if it's got Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, is it already all certified? Or is it no. Uh, so the cert certification is really interesting because they have to certify the chip and then the, what it goes in. If you embed a product, you have to go get that certified, and you have to certify with um, the FCC if you're selling in America. You have to certify with CE if you're if you're selling in Europe. And so certification's like a man. That's that's like a whole talk. I tell you. Um, so Wilderness Labs, um, so what, what are we? Well, we own the Netuino brand. We manufacture Netuinos. Uh, Netuino 
is a, what I like to think of as a prototyping, a quick prototyping platform. It's a microcontroller, uh, Arduino form factor, runs the .NET micro framework, um, and uh, makes things a lot easier to hack and, and to, um, uh, uh, to, to build stuff. It's a, it's a high level thing, you get, um, um, you can use Visual Studio, you get the, like I said, the .NET micro framework. You don't, it's not um, completely modernized, so it's kind of stuck in like 2000 and, uh, and two or whatever, um, so it's not full uh, .NET. It's what runs on this chip, um, but it's pretty cool. Um, you get real time debugging, and, and um, it's got a threading model and stuff, and so um, it's it's very high level. Um, and we're working on a VNX platform. Basically, we have got Mono uh, running. Who knows what Mono is, by the way? Okay, so Mono is the open source uh, version of .NET before Microsoft did their open sourcing. Uh, and it runs everywhere. It runs on ARM and stuff. And we've got it uh, running on a microcontroller, which is, we spent a year and a half doing that. And it's like a, a huge, like, I, I, think that there, I think that there are things in technology in which there's still problems in which it takes someone who is like a Newton or, or a, a, an Einstein to like sit down in a room for a really long time and, um, and hack and, and they move the state of the art like way, way far for, forward. Um, I think what we've done by getting mono running on a microcontroller is, is like one of those feats. And, we'll, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But um, we're gonna launch this uh, later this summer. Uh, you'll see our, um, our crowdfunding uh, campaign and stuff. Uh, there'll be a link to uh, sign up for our newsletter so you can find out more about that. Um, but what I recommend for people uh, who are like trying to hack and build things is you know, prototype with uh, Netduino today, go to market with Meadow tomorrow. It's going to be embeddable form factor. Um, it will run on an ESP32 and an STM32 F7. So uh, we'll have kind of a spectrum of needs covered um, from your smart toothbrush to a better form factor for sort of like mid-level uh, things. And kind of like a Raspberry Pi-ish form factor um, for like high-end appliances where you need camera and display, touch screen, et cetera. Um, but all, all uh, microcontroller based, yeah. Uh, are they all external maintainers? I can't see whether that's uh, RF connected or not. So our, our, um, our Feather one is the one that we're working on right now. It's got a chip antenna, um, but we'll probably do a, a, a copper antenna with an external plug. Um, so today I'm gonna talk about, uh, I'm gonna talk about, Net, I'm gonna show you some Netduino stuff. Um, it, I want to point out that we have some really fantastic developer documentation and community if you want to do uh, um, Netduino development today. Um, I, I think that uh, Netduino, like I said, is a fantastic prototyping platform and we'll, we'll, look at, uh, uh, we'll look at that a little bit. First I want to show you a demo. Um, I want to show you, this is my smart dehydrator. Um, and uh, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, there, there's no food in it. Um, so I have a, I have a Xamarin app here, um, and I, it's, that's, there's the Xamarin app somewhere. Here we go, I entered the IP. Eventually you won't have to do this. We're exposing, uh, we're gonna uh, publish over UDP the name of the appliance and stuff, so you just like have a list in here. Um, so anyway, I have, a, I have an app, and I can, I set the IP, I choose my, my temperature and I hit um, the, the power button and lo and behold, dehydrator turns on. Very, very fancy. Um, hit the power button again and you won't hear it turn off right away because it's got a 27 cool down. So dehydrator is basically a low temp oven. Um, and so there was, the, there was a 10 second cool down elapsed and dehydrator turns off. So there's an integral a heating element and a fan. So you can imagine that this is basically just a low temp um, uh, convection oven. There's more to this dehydrator, but it's just a big empty box and it's really like unwieldy to haul around. So oh, I didn't, I didn't, I just like took ass in the caterpillar here. Um, so this is, and it's also, you can run this stuff on board. Um, I have, we have this cool little uh, menu, um, which I, I got a, a bit of a bug. Um, but it sells you the current temp, tar, uh, target temp. You can click for more, and then you can kind of scroll through and and um, set the temperature. 
click on that, and you can roll through, and, and uh, you know, you can, it it's, uses a rotary encoder, which is like a volume knob on your, uh, your stereo. Set the temperature, and then you can um, scroll down again and, and turn on, and the same sort of thing happens. Uh, so anyway, that's my smart dehydrator, and I'm going to tell you uh, in the very small amount of time that we have today how to build this, uh, believe it or not. So there's a couple of different, there's a few different components to this. Uh, first of all, we're controlling electrical mains, uh, household mains electricity, which we think of as 110 or 240, depending on where you're at. Um, and then we use PID to regulate the temperature, and we'll talk about what PID is. Uh, and then we have this UI, um, this LCD menu UI um, that's uh, driven by rotary encoder. You can also use buttons. Uh, and then we've exposed control of the, of, the, of the appliance via a web API. And then finally, there's this Ameren app that uh, controls it if you, want to, um, if you want to control it that way. Now, you can control it other ways. It's just a JSON uh, web API. Um, so you can just you can enter uh, stuff in the browser. Um, so first thing about this is that this fantastic enclosure here, which is 3D printable um, and open source. Uh, you can find this up on our up on our 3D print designs uh, GitHub repo. Uh, holds uh, everything that you need to hack an appliance. So it's uh, it's got power distribution, uh, and I employed it. So I when I'm doing this, I'm zap myself. Um, it's got power distribution. Holds a relay, um, holds an Arduino, uh, has a built-in spot for this uh, rotary encoder menu system and whatnot. Uh, that's very cool. And the next thing is um, Netuino Foundation. So this is really what this is like the secret sauce of what we've done with Netuino. Um, Netuino Foundation is a massive uh, API that provides a, a really big um, set of uh, driver peripheral libraries for LCD screens, for sensors, for for basically hardware that you want to plug in. Um, and it makes hardware development really a plug and play experience. Um, and you can install it via NuGet. Um, so it's super easy to install uh, those, the different peripherals and stuff. So if you go out and buy a serial LCD, you go to NuGet, you search Netuino Foundation, serial LCD, pull down the driver and it, it's good to go. And it is like, it's, it, it, honestly, I did, um, so I built my chicken coop, uh, um, and it also has like PID stuff built in. So I, I did my chicken coop, um, just the, the temperature regulation of my chicken coop, which is done with a heat lamp. I built the app, uh, and uh, I built the app after I kind of put the hardware and plugged the hardware together um, from start to finish in 10 minutes, which is insane for building like a sophisticated PID uh, control system. Um, so anyway, uh, Nedrino Foundation's uh, awesome. Here's uh, an example of how to do uh, power control. So. So this, I mentioned, uses a, a relay to control 110 power. Um, a relay, these re, uh, relays are, are really cool because they, they um, isolate two different types of electricity or two different circuits. So what, what, I'm, what I'm doing here is that um, I'm controlling 110 electricity via a five volt relay. Um, actually, who here knows what a relay is? I don't really have to go, everyone gets different. Pretty much everyone understands a relay. Um, so to drive this is super easy from uh, Netuino. You create an output port, and then you write to that output port. So it sends a signal, a three volt signal, um, which and then I use a transistor um, switch to drive five volts, because uh, I've got a power supply specifically for my uh, relay there. Um, and then with that Netuino foundation, um, you actually just create a new relay object and, and pass it in. And, and we've, we've got like a, a kind of a nice API on top of that. This is a very, that, this is a very simple explanation of, of what Netuino Foundation is. But just so you understand um, how I'm doing the relay there. Uh, this next thing is uh, our text display menu. And I think that the text display menu is like really, really, really cool. And I want to show you um, on my desktop here I have Ooh. actually um, for those of you that didn't see in the back, um, here's the menu in action. Um, that's not, that is the menu, but that's not my video, the one that I wanted to show you. But that's fine. Um, so text display menu is pretty cool. Um, it's, uh, it's part of Netuino Foundation. And um, let's go back to present mode. And uh, you can, um, it's, it's driven by JSON. You can define your menus in JSON. Um, you, you load them up. Um, and then uh, there's, there's like selected events on there. And um, 
Uh, menu automatically exits. There's a, you can show the back button and, and then you can go to like display screen, etc. Uh, super easy to work with. You can see uh, when, when something's command, uh, selected, you can switch on the command and uh, when evaluation, there's actually one of the really cool things about this is that it has a bunch of built-in um, editable menu items. So like for um, numeric entry or alphanumeric entry, um, and then spe uh, specialized ones like for temperature and, and, and uh, whatnot. So you can, you just, you just put those in, um, in your JSON and then you automatically get editable uh, menus. So this is a way to like provide a prototype user interface for folks, really, really easy. This makes hardware hacking like way, way easier because now you, you've, got a, you've got a UI for free um, and it works across any, um, any LCD, um, with any LCD um, uh, uh, transport. Uh, so some of these LCDs have like I squared C backpacks or SPI backpacks. It works with those, it works with just GPIO driven. This one's got, this one's just, I'm just driving it straight through GPIO. I don't have like an I squared C um, interface. Uh, but it works with all those transparently. Um, it's seamless, so no matter which one you're using, it, you just plug it in. Uh, we have a, I, it's an eye text display interface, and we have drivers for uh, all these different uh, protocols. Um, so it makes it super, super easy. Uh, the next thing is PID, and um, so PID is proportional integral derivative, and this is the algorithm that like sort of puts all algorithms to shame. Uh, this is the algorithm that your car uses for cruise control. This is the algorithm algorithm that uh, keeps drones on uh, level flight in the air. This is the algorithm that keeps ships on a, on a, on a course heading uh, in rough seas, etc. And um, it uses calculus, and it's really kind of fun. Um, we've got it built into the Netduino Foundation, so it's super easy to use. If you want to learn about PID, we have a fantastic uh, PID guide, and I don't just say that because I wrote it, but it's actually really good. Um, I had to learn all about PID to write it, and it was really fascinating. Um, and then in Netduino Foundation, we have some PID controllers built in. Um, so if you're interested in that, this is like, uh, uh, you know, this is, in this case, PID is what uh, maintains the temperature and makes sure that when you turn on the oven, it gets to the right temperature and it keeps it at that right temperature without like just oscillating back and forth and into a mess. Um, PID is really awesome. Um, to use it in here, it's super easy. You can create a new PID controller. <clears throat> you set your P, I, and your D components. Um, in this case, we use just P and I uh, because derivative is, is usually PIDs um, for temperature control and things like that, you only use P and I. Um, the, the guide explains why, but it's basically because um, derivative is based on um, signal quality from your sensor and, and the slope of so the slope of the line and sensors can be noisy. Um, but uh, you know, depending on what you're doing, you might be using uh, D, like if you're doing servo stuff. Uh, so super easy to set up. Create a new Netwindow Foundation PID controller. Set up your um, your constraints. For in this case. Um, the power, the output min and max um, is from 0% to 100% to control the, um, the PWM, which is, uh, who knows, uh, who doesn't know what a PWM is? No, I'm, I'm not gonna explain it then. Um, and then we have, we spin up a thread. I mentioned that the .NET micro framework is threading, which is nice in a microcontroller uh, uh, system. Uh, so we spin up a, a temperature uh, maintenance thread uh, we read the actual input from the sensor, we specify our target input, which is what we want it to be at, and then PID does the, crunches the calculations, um, uses the calculus, and tells you what to set your um, PWM for the heater at, which is really fantastic, so you don't have to write it yourself. And then um, we expose all of this control via a thing called Maple uh, Server, um, and Maple Server is a purpose-built uh, uh, modern RESTful uh, web API server for Netduino. So it's very, very tiny, it's very simple to use. Um, and uh, has built-in JSON support and stuff. This is cool, it's super easy to use. This is, um, you basically create a new uh, request handler um, and, then you, and then you associate that with the server, you instantiate the server, pass it your request handlers. And um, we go through your handlers and we, we parse out the method names and uh, so in, in the case of this, it's got three methods. It's got a get method, which is a status, and then it's got two post methods, uh, turn on and turn off. 
in this case, you see post turn on. Um, so we've, we've, we've parsed that and we know that we, we can expose it. We should expose that as, as that post um, uh, API. Um, so uh, not a lot of time to, to talk about that. But uh, from an architectural standpoint, um, an appliance, so like in this case, the appliance uh, has sort of one, um, one app that controls everything, and then we instantiate controllers within that. Um, so in this case, the, the app, you fire up the, the app, um, which is just a C Sharp class. You instantiate all your peripherals, in this case, the LCD, rotary encoder, fan, heater, relay. And, and, and when I say instantiate those peripherals, really uh, those are, um, you're creating new Nantuino.foundation relay, and then you pass it uh, the pin, like what we saw before. Um, and it hides a lot of the, the underlying plumbing and stuff. And then you create a dehydrator controller, and that, you know, in appliance, you're always breaking down sort of the different control systems and encapsulating them in controllers. So you, you create a dehydrator controller, you pass references to the various peripherals. Um, you know, for the maple web server, you have this request handler, and then you listen for events that come off of that. Um, and then the app is sort of the overarching um, uh, uh, Grand Central uh, station, if you will. It's listening for events from the web server, it's listening from uh, events from the dehydrator controller, and then it's, it's telling the dehydrator controller, hey, you need to turn on, set your runtime, et cetera. Um, if you guys know a PWM and, and other stuff, I'm not, I'm not gonna explain a controller. I think you guys get that. Um, controllers are cool. We don't often write them in .NET, um, but with hardware, it's one of those things that you need controllers all the time because everything's managed by controllers. Uh, and then finally, the Xamarin um, app is very simple. It's just a Xamarin Forms app, and uh, we, uh, we just uh, create an HTTP client and talk to the RESTful interface. And, and I show this, it could be anything. You know, you could have written this app in, in whatever. You're just talking to an API endpoint that's on, um, you know, that's exposed on the web server here. Uh, so that's super easy to do. Um, so, you know, I, I, like I said, I think that this, this space is, we are just at the beginning. Um, and the things that, 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 that are gonna be built um, haven't, there's so many things that people haven't even thought of, or you know, they're, they're like, there's so many things that have to be built before people can even think of these other things. And, and um, I think that the, the, the folks that I'm out talking to now, you guys are gonna be building these things in the future. You are the future of like tomorrow's technology. So I hope that you get out there um, and start building. Um, check out our platform, go to wildernesslabs.co. Um, I have Netduinos for sale. Um, if anybody wants to buy one today, we got a, like a big discount on them. Um, I'll be down in the, the, the like social space down there. Um, so come by if you want to buy a Netduino. I have Netduino uh, three Wi-Fi and three Ethernet, and there uh, there's a huge discount, and you get a cool uh, laser engraved uh, prototyping baseboard and stuff. Um, so uh, come, you know, if you want a Netduino, come get one. Um, we're uh, going to be out doing some interesting things over the next next couple of months. We'll be at Maker Fair next week. We've got some talks coming up. Uh, and then we're going to launch our our Meadow um, crowdfunding campaign probably in July. And then we have uh, we run a Hardware Hackers meetup. Uh, one and it's here, San Francisco, BC, some other places. So come see us. Um, and sign up for a newsletter if you want to you know keep uh, keep in touch. And uh, like I said, slides up at slideshow.net, Brian Kostnich. Uh, and the code for this is, uh, is up on our GitHub repo. I'm sorry that was so fast. This is normally like an hour talk, so um, thank you.